Hi, my name is Keith. Today I want to talk about premature ventricular contractions, the heart condition that I had, and I had an RF ablation to correct. Now, my experience is not going to be your experience, and I am not a doctor or medical professional. I'm not giving medical advice here. I'm just sharing my experiences to hopefully help you if you face this problem. If you were searching for PVCs or for ablations or for something of the sort, you may have been directed here. Now, I'm using my normal channel to put this video out. If you're one of my thousands of regular subscribers, thank you so much. This video isn't going to have anything to do with my normal channel content. And with the birds singing and the airplanes flying by and cars driving past, it's getting pretty noisy out here. Let's go into the studio. All right, that's a little better. It's quite a bit quieter in here, and I really wanted to be able to speak clearly so you can hear me. So before we get started, I'm going to put chapters down on the timeline here so that you can go to the parts that interest you the most, because there's a lot of information here, and I think it's important to get the message across to you, not only the decision I made, why I made the decision I made, what my condition was prior to the treatment, and what I have today. So let me introduce you to a couple other versions of me. The first is me two days before the procedure. The second one is me two days after the procedure. I am 92 or 93 days after the procedure at this point, and just call me 90 day Keith. So we have two days before, two days after, and 90 day Keith, because there's some big differences. I was actually reviewing the video that I took before the procedure and immediately after, and looked at it in comparison to what I look like in the mirror today. And I'll let you make your own judgments about that. I'm gonna interject a few comments here and there, things that I forgot to say back when I took those original recordings so that I can give you the rest of the story as the story comes up. Let's go to two days before Keith and let him tell you why he made that decision, what his options were, and the considerations that he went through prior to going to this procedure. It's Sunday, the 27th of February, 2022, and I need a cardiac ablation for premature ventricular contractions, or PVCs. I haven't had the procedure yet. I have received a lot of comfort from watching the videos of other people that have had ablations and left videos on YouTube for the rest of us to see. It's very comforting to see. Unfortunately, a lot of those videos, if not all of them that I found, were for ablations for AFib. Well, AFib is a different animal from PVCs, and I thought it might be good to do kind of a public service announcement as to what I experience and what kind of results I get. So let me give you a quick timeline of where we are today. I was first diagnosed with PVCs in 2016, approximately six years ago. At that time, I was hypokalemic. In other words, I had low potassium in my blood. The treatment for it was to get my blood potassium up. Not a big deal. Start eating high potassium foods and everything is okie dokie. And my PVCs slowed in frequency over time and got better. And I continued with my life. I'm an athlete. I continue to work out. And everything is going just wonderfully. I'm not going to get into the why that I believe caused my PVCs to get worse recently. It doesn't matter because only the what matters. I was recently down in Phoenix for vacation and had to check myself into the ER right in the middle of vacation because I was having chest pain with heavy PVC activity. After several hours of being checked out, I was released without any drugs or treatment and instruction to go visit with a cardiologist. I had visited with my cardiologist just a couple of months ago and explained to my cardiologist that my Garmin wristwatch was doing this on an unfortunately frequent basis. That was also combining with increased PVC activity. I was getting them more frequently and they were heavier. My cardiologist explained to me that I was getting pseudo bradycardia. In other words, my wristwatch was reading a bradycardic heart rate, but I really didn't have bradycardia. My heart was beating at twice that rate. Only half of the beats were effective in getting to my wrist. Well, this is the same cardiologist that had told me that any PVCs greater than 17% of the total beats would weaken my heart over time. Cardiologist didn't seem too disturbed by my report of new symptoms and sent me on my way with no new treatments except for a change to my cholesterol medication. Fast forward to the 10th of February and I am checking myself into St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. 
and I have to thank the staff at the St. Joseph's ER. They did multiple blood tests, a couple of EKGs, and left me on a cardiac monitor for several hours so that they could visualize what was going on with my heart. To give you an idea of what that looks like, here's a picture I took while I was in the hospital of the monitor that was behind me, unfortunately. The top line is all squiggly on the far right because I turned around to take a photo with my camera and that causes the monitor to go a little wild when I move. The bottom line shows exactly what's going on. Every third beat was a PVC. So after that experience, I went back to vacation. And after one more day of vacationing, I became weak and tired and fatigued to the point where I couldn't continue with my vacation and limped my way home. It was a long drive from Phoenix to where I live in Washington State. On the way back, I scheduled an appointment with a new cardiologist. And the message that I have here is don't be afraid to get a second opinion, to get another opinion, to get the right opinion. And that's the one thing that I want you to see through this video. We have a saying in my favorite sport that if you make hammers, Everything looks like a nail. And the one piece of advice that I will give you today, right now, being a patient, there are two kinds of cardiologists. Let me describe them as plumbers and electricians. If you have a cardiologist and they happen to be a plumber, they may not be the best person to consult with for electrical problems. You wouldn't let a plumber work on the electrical in your house, would you? I found a new cardiologist that is an electrophysiologist. In other words, this is a doctor that deals with rhythm problems in the heart. I met with the electrophysiologist last Wednesday, and we discussed the EKG that was taken by St. Joseph's. And that EKG was enough before the cardiologist ever walked into the room for him to know that I was a good candidate for an ablation. There's more than one treatment path here available. Drugs can be used as well, and where I'm not a doctor, I'm not going to describe what the drugs are. I don't understand them well enough. I do a lot of research, and I did a lot of research before I met with the cardiologist. I wanted to understand what I was in for before I got there. Now, I made a choice in this. I could have elected to be treated with drugs for this condition, but suppression of a problem and physical correction of a problem are two entirely different things. I chose, after a lot of research, that I wanted to do an ablation instead. It was an option offered to me, and... I thought, you know, let's fix it. Right now, I am wearing a heart monitor, a Holter monitor. I have a piece up here and sensors all over my chest. They're just recording my heart until the day before the procedure that they're going to then download and use that data in determining how best to treat my PVCs. This procedure is not without risks, and my doctor was very clear about what the risks of the procedure are. In my mind, the way I live, the risks are not excessive at all, in my opinion, and therefore I'm proceeding forward with the procedure. Let me give you an idea of what my symptoms are today. I have extensive fatigue. I'm tired almost all the time and really am not motivated to get up and go do things. When I lay down to sleep at night, my heart starts skipping every other beat. And as a result, my heart rate at my wrist drops into the 40s. As a matter of fact, Here's a graph of what my resting heart rate is over the last year. You notice right here at the end, all of a sudden it drops off rapidly. This is my condition, in my opinion, getting worse. There is no resting heart rate when your heart's skipping beats. You can't figure out what it is. Even taking my pulse right now, my heart beats five or six times and then takes a little break before beating again. If you have PVCs, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When I slow down, sit down, lay down, I have huge... PVCs and it results in chest pain. Right now my chest hurts. I've been having almost continuous PVCs for three weeks now that have been pretty aggressive and pretty violent in my opinion. If I'm sitting in a chair or laying down, I actually feel my body slightly bounce with each pulse. Keith, before the procedure, was determined to do this. This was really important. This was a decision that was made not in the moment, but had been made over a period of several weeks in the run-up to going to see the electrophysiologist. Two days before Keith went into the hospital, two days after Keith came out. Now, I had a problem while I was in the hospital that had absolutely nothing to do with the procedure, and that resulted in the doctors keeping me overnight for observation. But that's a minor consideration and not something you should consider in part of your decision-making processes because I think that was really individual to me. But let's go to two-day after Keith and let him tell you about his experience 
in the hospital. The procedure was really a cakewalk, and I already have noticed a big change in my heart. Now, in preparation for this, I had looked at Dr. Robinson's lectures, which I'll leave a link below uh, if I haven't mentioned it already in this video. And Dr. Robinson has a slide in there where she points out that sometimes, oops, the patient showed up and they left their PVCs at home. When I'm not having PVCs, they can't find them to fix them. And I knew that going into the procedure. As a hedge against uh, having to do it twice, I went ahead and reduced my sleep to five hours a night for the two nights prior to this procedure. And I didn't take any additional potassium supplementation for those two days either because I knew the potassium supplementation reduced my PVCs by a significant amount, and I wanted to make sure I was having PVCs when I got there. The biggest stressor for me was that I could show up and not have PVCs, and then we would have a problem. And while the doctors have drugs they can give you that can cause the PVCs to reappear, I didn't want to be dependent on that process. So I showed up, and I was having bigeminy. It was thunderous in my chest, which is good because the electrophysiologist showed up, took one look at the monitor, made a comment about you're having a lot of PVCs today, and off we went. I was picked up from the surgical ward where they had already started an IV and prepped the area for the insertion of the catheters, which was in my groin. And guys, I, I want to point this out because this is a really important point. I know the groin is a sensitive area and people are, are really hesitant to have anybody messing around down there. But the nurses in these wards are absolute quiet professionals. They treated me with such respect and dignity that I, the trouble they went to to make sure that I didn't feel uncomfortable while they were working is, I, I can't explain it. They're great. And I really would ask that if, if you're hesitant about it for that reason, don't be. Back to the procedure. I was picked up by the electrophysiology team. There were nurses that specifically work in this lab and came and got me, took me down to the lab. We transferred to the table and they started doing the prep work on me. Now, the anesthesiologist and the an electrophysiologist had had a conversation at bedside with me as a participant in the conversation. They wanted my opinion on things about anesthesia because this is my eighth surgery in life and I've been under general anesthesia for I believe seven of them. So I have a really good idea of what my body does under general anesthesia and we had a discussion about how long I could hold still under light sedation and whether I'd be able to lay still or not. Now, at 50 years old, I can't lay still for very long, especially flat. I fidget after just two or three minutes, and moving around is not going to help your doctor at all. So the decision was made to do general anesthesia. Went in, started getting set up for the procedure, which included putting four patches on my back, two patches on my flanks, and I believe there were three patches on my chest, you know, big patches like this stuck to my chest, and then the various patches for the EKG leads so that they could map my heart. The anesthesiologist advised me that they were going to start pushing medication for the anesthesia and that they were not going to use lidocaine. Lidocaine is a um, numbing agent, best I can tell, and without the lidocaine, the anesthesiologist was concerned that I might feel a warm sensation or a burning sensation as they put the medicine in. I have no idea if I did or not because I don't remember anything after that very short conversation. I conversed with him for just a moment, uh, told, told the nurses that I'd see him later, and that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in the uh, recovery unit with a nurse sitting at my bedside, literally looking at me continuously watching the monitor, watching me as I woke up. After I woke up sufficiently, they moved me back to my room. And they made me lay flat on my bed, absolutely flat, laid out on my back for four hours after the procedure was done to make sure that I didn't start any bleeding at the insertion sites. They went in through veins, not arteries, so it's not as big of a deal, but it's still a risk, so they want to make sure that they get that right. 
the doctor had closed the, uh, the sites with a figure eight stitch, which is simply a way of making sure that the skin doesn't pull open and pull the vein open. Those were removed after four hours, and that was completely and utterly painless. I didn't feel a thing when the nurses removed those stitches. So the doctor said before the procedure that I would have PVCs after the procedure. The reason is the ablation causes a little bit of inflammation in the heart, and it makes it angry inside, if, if you will. So you will have some PVCs after the ablation for up to eight weeks, is what my discharge instructions say. But the number of PVCs I've had so far today is so low that it's not even funny. Let me give you some stats of what the Holter monitor that I was wearing when I spoke to you last showed. Over the period of nearly five days, I had over 102,000 PVCs. Kind of a big number, right? You break that down, you're talking a little over 20,000 PVCs per day. My PVC burden was just shy of 20%. PVCs are not hazardous unless it leads to ventricular tachycardia, in which case looking up a little bit on WebMD and some other sites shows that that could be a gateway to other bad outcomes. So I was surprised by the ventricular tachycardia count, 233 episodes in five days, with the longest being three beats. I had actually three different morphologies of PVC. Now, this is important because we thought it was a monomorphic PVC based on the EKG that was taken in the hospital down in Phoenix. But the rate of the other two PVC morphologies 17 times in five days is a really small number. And that was morphology two. Morphology three was like a single digit number in five days. The understanding is that they're going to go after that primary morphology and fix that one because that's causing the vast majority of my PVCs. That's exactly what the doctor did. And right now, how I feel is this. I am having some PVCs. Uh, I think my PVC count of noticed PVCs during the day, this is just my feel, there's no heart monitor on me, is 24 at this point, And I've been awake for about seven hours. Take into account that when I was having the PVCs prior, I was having about 30 per minute. Right now, I have a little bit of discomfort in my chest, which is treated with Tylenol or ibuprofen. Uh, it's not bad. I have a sore throat from the breathing tube when I was under general anesthesia. It's not bad. It's a minor inconvenience. Uh, there's no pain at the insertion sites at all. Um, I'm under restrictions not to lift anything over 20 pounds for a week. Uh, no, no heavy exercise. Um, and I'm going to be really gentle with my body because I know that I have a tendency to overdo things. It's so quiet in my chest. I keep checking my pulse right now because it makes me nervous that I don't feel my heart thumping around. I don't feel my pulse in my neck, in my abdomen, in my legs. I'm not feeling it. But what I did notice this morning, now this morning was the first morning that I got up out of my own bed because I spent the night in the hospital and that was because of a, a personal medical limitation of my own. It had nothing to do with the procedure itself. Getting out of bed this morning and was immediately able to walk instead of hobbling to the next room. It's been years that I've been getting up and hobbling. My legs felt like they were asleep and really super heavy, and they didn't feel like they worked quite right when I got up. This morning I got up and I felt like I could just go walk a mile. It wasn't a big deal. The difference in how I feel today compared to how I felt when I woke up Tuesday morning is night and day. It is completely different. I haven't felt this well in quite some time. All right. As you can see, I was still, or he was still, now I'm confused who I am in this thing. No, I'm just kidding. So I was still pretty tired and rummy because I had had one night's sleep in my own bed before I made that video, which means that I had been pretty badly sleep deprived prior to making it. As you could see on my face, I was pretty groggy when I made that video. Let me give you a few of the general comments that I have at this point. Let's talk about the recovery because you know two days after Keith was still having PVCs and the doctor had told me that there was a reflection period of about two weeks in which I would continue to have PVCs until my heart kind of got used to the new situation. Well, he was absolutely 100% correct. At about 10 days, I had a day where I noticed that I didn't have any PVCs. 
And then I had one the next day and then none the next day and none the next day. And as a matter of fact, at this point, it's been over 60 days since I've felt a PVC in my chest. Yes, 60 days with not a single one. Now, I did have a sleep study done because I was having fatigue problems before this procedure. The scheduling worked out that I had the procedure before I had the sleep study. The sleep study saw one PVC during the night, but that was about two and a half or three weeks after the procedure. Since then, I haven't seen anything. There hasn't been anything. There's not been any discomfort, no problems, no weird feelings in my chest. And I'm getting my athleticism back. I'm actually going out and I've started jogging again. I used to run distance and I stopped doing so in about 2012 because of family and work things. And in 2016, when my heart started acting up, I realized that I was sensitive to caffeine and, and exercise tended to set it off. And I really stopped exercising hard at all. So I became a couch potato in a real hurry. But with my new heart, I'll call it a new heart. It's the same heart I had in my chest before. It just behaves differently now. With my new heart, I'm having to learn what it feels like as I exert myself. So I just started jogging recently, about three weeks ago. Now, my doctor said that I could start exercising hard at my one month check, but I was a little timid about it because, well, I wasn't accustomed to what my heart did. The heart rate moved smoothly now and it, it accelerated to what it should be and stayed there while I exercised. And as soon as I stopped exercising, my heart rate would come back down to normal and not go bouncing all over the place, you know, down to 30, up to 80, down, you know, over to 120, all over the place like it was before. No, it just slowly settles down to your effort level and just stays there. And that was actually disconcerting. I am so hypervigilant about my heart because of this condition. It was disconcerting and it took me a while to get accustomed to how my heart behaved to where I would be comfortable exerting myself over periods of time. Now, I've also been doing strength training and other stuff, and I'm not going to give you this big show of strength, how, how strong and, and incredibly athletic I am today, because that doesn't make any difference. The point is, my heart behaves differently than what it used to, and it also has some features now that normal healthy hearts have that I never had before, which is awesome. By the way, my heart rate recovery is incredibly good now, and it wasn't before. So that health marker, although it was probably biased by the PVCs, has come into alignment with what we would expect for someone in my age group at my health status. So let's get into the one other thing that I really want to talk about here, because this was something that really worried me before this procedure. And that was cost. I had seen videos from all over the world about ablations, most of them having to do with AFib. And they were talking about these humongous numbers, you know, $300,000, $500,000. And I was thinking, oh, wow, if my insurance company doesn't cover this, I'm in real trouble. Well, let me be really honest with you about this. The Emergency room visit in Phoenix totaled a little over $9,000, which make you sweat a little bit. I have good insurance from my employer, so that wasn't a big deal. My out-of-pocket was 200 and some dollars for that. Wasn't a big deal. I had the Holter monitor that I had to pay a couple hundred dollars for as part of my deductible with my insurance. And then all of the doctor's visits. And then we did the sleep study on the other end, and I added that in to the total for all of my medical bills. So what we had is we had a big emergency room visit for a cardiac problem. We had an ablation with all the associated pieces, you know, the heart monitoring and all the tests and all of the drugs and, you know, anesthesia, the doctor to do the ablation, the hospital bill, an overnight stay in the hospital, the whole works. And then I had a sleep study on top of it. The total for all of it that was billed to my insurance company was $105,000. So if we take off the sleep study and we take off the $9,000 for the emergency room visit, we're looking more at about $86,000 total. That's all of the bills together. If you have insurance, you're going to pay your out-of-pocket maximum. In my case, it was a relatively small number, 
And I paid that gladly because it was well worth it. For me, in all, it was a great thing. I feel like a brand new man. I'm 50 years old, going on 51, and I am more athletic, more energetic, and more powerful than I ever have been in at least 10 years. And that is a great feeling. I, I would encourage anyone that is looking at this procedure to go forth boldly, talk to their doctors, and make a decision based on your needs and your condition. What's right for me may not be right for you, but my outcome was pretty sparkling. Anyway, that's all I have on this one. I hope that you at least have some comfort from seeing what happened with my situation as you go forward dealing with yours. If you would, do everybody a favor that comes to this video later. Leave a comment below letting, letting me know that you watched this and what you thought of the video and whether this was helpful in your decision-making process. Because I would like to know if I'm actually helping people and the people that come after you will get this video easier out of YouTube because of the algorithm if there's some comments down there. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your patience as I fumbled my way through this video. I didn't write a script for it because a scripted video doesn't sound very genuine, should we say. This is right off the top of my head, right out of my heart. And from my heart to yours, be well.